Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Bernoulli. Today we have Claudio Grass, Godfrey Bloom, and Ira Harris. Claudio is a Mises ambassador and an independent precious metals advisor based out of Switzerland. His Austrian approach helps his clients find tailor-made solutions to store their physical precious metals under Swiss law. Godfrey entered the world of politics in 2004. Before that, he worked in the city of London for 40 years and won fixed interest investment prizes. He served as a member of the European Parliament for a decade and became widely known as a vocal opponent of government regulation and centralization. And Ira is an independent trader, hedge fund manager, global macro consultant, trading foreign currencies, equities, bonds, and commodities for over 40 years. He also served as CME director from 1997 to 2003 and also recently. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome to you. Thank you. Oh, pleasure. Thank, thank you very much for the invitation. Richard. Great. Just as you, I, 50 minutes ago, I got a uh, story out of the FT. ECB urged to decarbonize its five trillion corporate bond. Five trillion corporate bond. First of all, I don't think the ECB has is holding five trillion in corporate bonds. Uh, but I mean, there's movements off of it. Overnight, I read the Ambrose Evans Pritchard piece in the uh, Telegraph. So there's all types of movement for us, and they're and they are going about this um you know it's the age-old discussion of externalities in terms of economics and uh listen pollution certainly has costs to it we we, we know that um and how does the society choose to pay for it but again the emphasis is how does this society choose to pay for it and and expressing it, you know, politically, uh, yes, in Germany, Germany is kind of interesting because I'm surprised that Merkel, uh, who after Fukushima moved so quickly to close down the uh, uh, nuclear, nuclear plants, uh, or at least not build anymore and kind of let them roll off use Bernanke language. Uh, when it comes to bonds, she was rolling off nuclear uh, facilities, but then went and started burning uh, some of the dirtiest coal that's mined in the world out of Germany. And she's never paid a political price for that, which kind of interesting. Um, but how, do this, how does this get financed? We are going to see, of course, uh, especially here in the United States, we have the, uh, the Green New Deal, and how that will be paid for. But again, it's the ability to reach ever deeper, uh, promote more programs. Uh, we, of course, we have the Biden, you know, pushing, and he will get somewhere close, I think. Um, I think they'll, they'll probably come up with a, a trillion and a half and they'll sell it on the infrastructure side, which I happen to agree. I don't agree with Larry Summers on much of anything, but you've done so much transfer payments to ease the burdens of, of certain people, although we, we, in the United States, we never means test anything, unfortunately, when we do these programs. So we take on far more than we ever need to uh, intend to. But had we actually done some updated infrastructure, which this country badly needs, it would have been a far more uh, positive program. Well, you know, but as usual, you, they build in so much pork uh, by the time they get something that there's going to be a huge cost to it. Uh, we'll probably, I hope, get into the deeper discussion of how they're going to contain paying the interest on that cost because that's the next argument that will certainly rise its head here as we get to, I, I, there's no way to avoid it, yield curve control in the United States, which will be uh, a major step for the global financial system as to how to dollar. But I think the, I think the Chinese are to that and uh, position themselves accordingly by um, whatever they're choosing to do with Yuan. And again, you know, we like the United States from the bottom up, but China is certainly always a down story. So you have to figure 
and, re- and analyze what they're doing from the top down. So I'm sure we'll get into that discussion. And uh, Godfrey, you've recently observed that the great central banking experiment has failed. Can you elaborate on that view and, and how that's happening? Uh, yes, it's interesting, isn't it? We've had, uh, you could you could argue one or the other, but I mean, I would suggest that the experiment is round about 100 years old, um, and the concept of it has been, <clears throat> the concept has it has been uh, a central bank in order to be uh, what has sometimes been argued academically as the bank, of, the lender of last resort. And of course, what we've actually seen is now the 100 years has come sort of full circle, as it were, that we have what is an underpin of what has been the Keynesian experiment, which is sometimes now referred to as modern monetary theory, uh, which is that debt doesn't matter uh, to the state. It matters to you or your family or your business, but it doesn't matter somehow to the state. Now, of course, this argument is ludicrous, of course, debt matters. You can't go on and on and on ad infinitum, spending more money than you actually bring in. All you do, of course, is degrade the currency. Uh, and we've seen, even in the last 20 years, since the beginning of this century, a basket of fiat currencies losing 80% of its value against gold. We know that when Nixon c- closed the gold window in uh, 1971, we know that the 1971 dollar now buys about six cents worth of goods and services. Well, if that isn't failure, I don't know what failure is. That screams failure. And as for the t- central banks being the lender of last resort, of course, we know that that's not, t- that is simply isn't true. The lender of last resort is the people, the taxpayer. And we found that out, of course, uh, in uh, in Britain, uh, when the banks had the banks in trouble had to be nationalized in 2007. And yet again, yet again, it's the little people that pick up the tab. It's your butcher, your baker, your cab driver, your hairdresser who picks up the tab for this in tax and degraded money, while the bankers get fatter and fatter. And I said, and it got over 30 million views when I was speaking in the European Parliament on this, until we start hanging bankers, this will never end. (laughs) And your thoughts, Claudio? Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, I love Godfrey. Yeah, I, you know, I to me, I, I have the feeling, I mean, the world has changed already. I mean, we're not going to go back to pre-corona days, and I think we are in the final stage of this, of the current system. And, uh, and corona is a scapegoat, uh, you know, not to blame the bankers and the, the politicians uh, for that for this big mess, uh, to basically just be able to blame it on this coronavirus. Because right now, I mean, you know, I mean, the financial market and the real economy is completely decoupled from each other. I mean, it's it's, it's a joke. I, when I look at the financial markets, I really feel like in Las Vegas, uh, because at the end of the day, it's, it's it's about the same. You know, markets are going up. At the same time, we see that private businesses are being destroyed on a global scale. We are in a lockdown for you know twelve months now. You know, partially and uh, ongoing. And uh, so, I mean, the division of labor on an international scale is is already disrupted tremendously. And uh, and big parts of the private economy, you know, small mid sized companies, restaurant owners, shop owners, and so on. I mean, they are they are broke. So um, so to me. Because the world has changed, uh, I, I only see two, two outcomes. You know, either we go uh, the decentralized uh, way or we go the centralized way. And I think when we see uh, what the, 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 the great reset guys, you know, the World Economic Forum, uh, the, the uh, Build Back Better movement and so on. I mean, these are all uh, ideas coming from the centralized side. And uh, I don't believe that this is going to be, you know, uh, can can solve it because central planning never worked. It will never work. So uh, um, because it will always lead to a misallocation of goods and services because you don't have prices in a centralized, uh, uh, in a centrally planned economy. And that's basically what these guys are looking for. 
And and so to me, I uh, you know I I truly believe that we don't have to kill the king if we just can ignore the king. And I hope that uh, a lot of people, individuals, are going to see what's coming because we are in the in the big calm right now before the storm. I mean, the avalanche is running. Uh, it hasn't hit yet, uh, but you know it's just a matter of time until you know the whole system is going to blow up. Uh, that's at least you know the way I see it. And then what? The people will make out of it if they're going to join you know the centralized side with all these centralized digital coins and the new green deal and the universal basic income and all that stuff uh, with you know the digital ids and the unity passports and the track tracing and so on um, we'll see how many people are going for that side you know the domesticated ones at the end of the day the people who are uh, who only want who are looking for shelter and food but uh, not for liberty uh, but and at the same time I, I believe a lot of people out there realize once uh, they will see that yeah their income is gone that the economy has collapsed uh, that they will you know move uh, exit you know the system uh, and and try to rebuild with like-minded people uh, a new uh, economy as well as as a as a, as a, a new so a system for society which is more decentralized so based on on the principles of subsidiarity and so on. And uh, Claudia, what are your thoughts on the the Swiss National Bank, a central bank of Switzerland, where you are based in terms of their monetary policies? Uh, uh, in the recent past, you know, doing essentially financial alchemy on uh, printing money to buy like U.S. equities, global equities. Uh, what are your thoughts on that and the sustainability of that? You know, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, as I said, you know, we had the balance 20 years ago, we had a balance sheet of roughly 50 billion. And now we're standing at what thousand, 1000 billion. So, I mean, it's, it's just crazy. And um, so, of course, you know, central bank has to do uh, what central banks are doing. Uh, but I, I truly believe it's the wrong approach. You know, it's, uh, I mean, even the, even the information, you know, our central banks were also telling us, you know, we have to, uh, we have to depreciate the currency and that makes us rich. Uh, I mean, this is, this is just nonsense. Uh, weakening the currency. I mean, if that would work, then Zimbabwe would be, you know, the the role model. And it, it seems a bit to me that Zimbabwe uh, School of Economics is the role model for for the world these days, and also for the, the Swiss National Bank. I mean, it's a it's a hedge fund, and um, so overall, I mean, it's it's just you know it helps to prolong certain certain things, but I think the outcome will be as catastrophic as for the rest of the central banks. And your thoughts, Ira? Yes, Richard, I like the way you set that table because I, look at if I think the, the experiment that the, the SNB has been running for well for at least uh, the last two years, but we can go probably go back to January 15th of 2015 when it unleashed the forces when it when it I don't know why they ever put a peg in to be here. I, I know that there's so much trade with your with the euro that they of course, but there was an indefensible situation. But what they have been doing is, is, is uh, if I was back in uh, school, if I could tolerate being with uh, the Ivory Tower idiots, uh, I would be doing my dissertation on the alchemy, the alchemy of the Swiss National Bank. Because unlike any other central bank, at least they're not buying their own shitty assets. They're not buying Swiss bonds. They're buying everybody else's real assets. Apple stock. Uh, we go, I think there's what, 3,800 different shares. And they're not buying ETFs. <laughs> they're buying individual companies. So at least they're going that route. I mean, uh, the ECB, of course, is buying the sovereign 19 uh, different countries. And I would probably say, well, I, I'm going to be, say, 14 of them I would never hold in my life. Five of them I might if there was an attractive enough yield. Um, but this is a, a great experiment. And, uh, you know, I love that Claudio talks about them talking their currency down because that's the only thing that uh, 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 Thomas Jordan seems to know how to do. Uh, now that uh, Hilda Brandon has been able to go shopping at the finest stores because she could trade uh, the inside information. And um, that's a whole different story. But it does rise to what China is doing. And so what Claudio talks about, 
And this is something I've been blogging about for months and months. And it goes back to Michael Pettis's work. If the Chinese economy is shifting to a domestic, more domestic-based consumption, again, you have to look at China top down. The bottom up is not there. It's not how decisions are made. But if they're shifting, and a major shift, as Pettis has suggested for quite a long time, so moving from the domestic consumption from 38%, let's say they go to 50%, which is still far below the uh, more developed economies of the world, they want a stronger currency. And when you look, the yuan, you know, and it's to me one of the great parts of the story of the last year that the yuan has gone from 6.8 or 6.85 or 6.9 all the way down as we sit here at 6.4 or 5 as we embark upon the Lunar New Year. But this has been a sustained rally. And at the same time, what has happened? Since last April, we've been on a major move in in uh, raw materials around the globe, be it grains, be it uh, iron ore, be it uh, now we're getting platinum involved, uh, copper, so many things. And you go, well, everybody's proclaiming because every central bank proclaims how slow the global economy is and the IMF worth a shit anyway. Uh, they always come up with their prognosis, which... If I would have invested based on their prognosis, I would have been uh, broke long ago. So I, I care not a lick for them. But they're talking about how slow the economy are, and yet commodity prices are going ever higher, especially in the grain market. And yet we've had, we're not in drought. We're in severe, we're, we're very robust uh, crops now. Brazil is bringing in another record crop. Uh, so somebody is accumulating lots of raw material. And I know that somebody has to be because it coincides with the continual strengthening of their currency. And if you're importing all these goods, you you may as well run a strong currency because that's the way you enrich your uh, your consumers. If you're trying to build a consumption-based uh, economy or, or try to switch from an export-oriented, you want a currency rising in value. Now, where the where they get concerned, I don't know. I. If I look at it, the technicals, as I'm prone to do at times, it's not, a, it's not how I start my trades, but it's how I protect myself and look for targets. Or may go, we may go back to that January 1st, 1994 level of 5.8 yuan to the dollar when the, chi when the Chinese government at the uh, commencement of NAFTA, January 1st, 1994, there are no coincidences, devalued the yuan 50% from 5. 8.7. Now they're redoing it. So they are in the middle of a shift. And as Claudio says, you, if you're trying to, you don't want to depreciate your currency if you want to enrich your middle class. So that continues to bear watching. Uh, related to that, Godfrey, do you see rising inflation for the indebted Western world in the pipeline? And if so, to what extent? Uh, well, yes, it has to be so. And of course, uh, Iris put his fingers right on it. He's absolutely right in everything he says. Uh, and uh, and uh, it, it is really, there's no other way of looking at it. Uh, if, you, if, you want to, if you want to get that end, you have to, de degradation of currency is never the answer. It's never, ever the answer to anything. Uh, and of course, just picking up very quickly on the ECB, when I was on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee in Brussels, <clears throat> what you have to understand, and I'm sure you do, uh, I'm sure you all do, uh, but maybe listeners may not uh, understand it quite so well, is that, of course, the euro and the ECB is a political, a purely political entity. Uh, so the fact that the ECB is buying the sort of rubbish that IRA, of course, would never buy, um, rubbish bonds, r rubbish sovereign debt, uh, and indeed, uh, even rubbish corporate debt, the ECB buys billions of euros worth of of appalling debt. For example, they say it's asset backed, for example, uh, and you'll be looking at, um, let's say, BMW finance or VW finance. What you're actually doing, the asset is a degrading value motor car. This is, a, this is the kind of thing, and I had this out with the president in committee on a number of occasions when it was professional drug. I was trying to explain to him, a lot of these people don't understand money. You'd be very surprised to know that I sat with these people and they don't actually understand 
either money or the consequences of their action. Now, we must have uh, inflation if you have, and of course, the Austrian definition of inflation is monetary inflation. Now, at the moment, of course, people think we haven't had inflation. Oh, it's only been 2% or oh, it's not reached the goal of 2%. That's absolutely nonsense. What we've actually seen is massive inflation in money, in monetary terms. We know that to be the case. And this money, of course, finds its way, <clears throat> as it always does, into the assets. It finds its way into assets because it's gone via the banks. And so consequently, you have the cantillon effect where the people at the beginning of the queue, at the front of the queue, uh, do very well because they're reserve, uh, first receivers of money. And the people at the back don't. Now, when you inflate currency, which is, is being inflated beyond the scale of human imagination, we're talking trillions. We're talking trillions. It's beyond human imagination, the sort of numbers that we're talking about. Debt, I think, of national corporate uh, and, and sovereign debt of 270 trillion globally. That is beyond human imagination. And to imagine that that won't go to the high street. Uh, it, uh, move from Wall Street to Main Street, as the Americans would say, is absurd. Of course it will. And uh, when you see the increase uh, in the uh, in in gold, for example, or platinum, or silver, or or whatever it is, or commodities, one mustn't ever make the mistake that. Uh, it is because these are going up in price. What you're seeing is the petrodollar is being degraded and it's going down. So if you had a gold, let's just take gold for a moment, if I may, keep it simple. If you have a gold sovereign dated 1905, it would have bought you bed and breakfast in London in 1905. If you have a gold sovereign today and went to London, it would buy you bed and breakfast in London. It, in fact, it would buy you bed and breakfast in any city in the world because it's a store of wealth, not an investment. Gold isn't an investment. It's a store of wealth. Uh, it's, it's, it's money. It's real money, as JP Morgan told us all those years ago. Only gold is money. Uh, so this is what we're dealing with. And as soon as you have fiat currency, paper currency, which governments can print and print on a scale undreamt of before, we won't just have inflation per se. We will, we will see um, it return to its intrinsic value. Paper money will go to its intrinsic value, which is nothing, which is nothing. And we will end up, instead what we saw in 1923 in the Weimar Republic, um, will then be global, certainly in the Western democracies who've been doing this scandalous counterfeiting of money now for a very long time. Uh, and so it's going to get it's going to get much, much worse. And I would suggest it's something that the world has never seen before. Uh, this isn't Hungary or post-war Austria or 1923 Weimar. This is on a global scale, the collapse of fiat currencies and the current banking system. And I don't think most people have got their handle on yet. Most people can't see this coming, you know. Uh, your thoughts, Claudio, and also for the potential of fiat currency collapse? Yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree with Godfrey. Um, I mean, you know, just if you think about one trillion seconds represents 31,709 years. So it's a huge sum. I mean, it's really, uh, and, and yeah, this is people, you know, normal people cannot grasp, you know, how big that figure is. And then on, on the other side, of course, you know, the scarcity of money is never an issue. It's always the scarcity of goods and services. That's because that's what it's all about. And uh, I mean, you know, these guys are propagating a reset. They are talking about the great reset. So I, to me, I mean, we should take these guys serious because what we are witnessing over the last 12 months, I mean, think about it. If, if somebody would have told you more than a year ago that they could shut down, you know, the, the global economy, uh, I mean, we would all have laughed about, about such a, a strange idea. And now we are in this crazy rational process uh, for, more, for more than a year. And um, so, I mean, yeah, goods and services are getting scarce. Uh, at the same time, we see that central banks are printing like crazy. And uh, so to me, I mean, this is not going to have a good outcome. And uh, I truly believe that we are going towards that reset. <coughs> but we don't know yet how it will look like, uh, you know, once it's coming down. And I even believe that these central planners, uh, these guys, they also have no clue. They just try to propagate certain ideas which would fit into their dogma, uh, in their ideological dogmas and in, into their specific uh, business uh, business uh, needs, but um, I don't believe that you know people are going to follow. 
I, I still believe that we are rational. You know, man is has to has uh, knows the concept of uh, we can think. You know, that distinguishes us from animals. Um, so you know, we are rational people. We can learn. Uh, we can combine. Uh, we can think independently. And um, and uh, one fine day, you know, in, in the coming weeks or months, I mean, we can already see over here in Switzerland that the the whole narrative is shifting. You know, people really are getting more upset day by day uh, because they see that their that their future is is demolished and uh, and that their businesses is basically destroyed. Um, so this is yeah, this is that that's where we are. And uh, and yeah, and we'll see. You know when the riots will break out. I mean, that's uh, we already see them uh, everywhere on this planet. But I think that's just the beginning. And uh, Claudio, you specialize in precious metals. Uh, can you give us your thoughts on short, medium term potential price uh, targets for gold, silver, and platinum? I mean. You know, to me, gold, gold and physical gold and silver and also platinum. I mean, as as uh, as, as Godfrey said, you know, gold is money. Everything else is credit. Um, so I'm I'm I'm, you know, I'm not in the gold business because I thought you know I can become a rich guy uh, very fastly. Uh, to me, it's it's also you know we need sound money for a sound society, and uh, and and gold is definitely gold became money because market participants decided freely uh, what they wanted to accept as money, and that so so the, the market has brought out gold and silver, and uh, and we have been on this global gold standard uh, at least you know until 1971, uh, as Godfrey mentioned when uh, Nixon closed down the gold window, and now for 50 years we are in this credit market and. And we have seen, you know, trillions being injected. Um, so I think, you know, short term, it's always hard to say because all the markets are manipulated. Everything is manipulated. Everything is fake out there. What you can see in the financial markets, in the news. I mean, it's really all fake. Um, but I, I, I just look at gold. You know, when I see the price levels right now, I truly believe it's extremely attractive. Everyone that has no gold is making a big mistake. I think you need physical gold, you need physical silver, platinum is a, is a bargain. Um, but also, you know, base metals are making hard assets are making sense uh, because they are going to profit from the inflation, which we're going to see, uh, I mean, rising uh, fastly over the coming months. Uh, so therefore, yeah, I'm, I'm very bullish for physical gold and silver. And um, uh, and I can only uh, recommend you know people that they should build up their hedge against uh, a crash of the current system. Great, and and Ari, your thoughts on the precious metals? Oh, you guys. Uh, um, so I was 100% agreement that gold's gold can have an uh, you know it can be money because you know what is what does money do? Money first and foremost. If the sovereign who issues it is a sound fiduciary, like the Swiss have historically been, um, and, and others in the United States was at one time, you have to have a fiduciary. And the danger for the system, of course, is that the global reserve currency thing but a fiduciary. So when I hear the hue and cry of, oh, the dollar is a haven, the dollar is not a haven of anything when you really cut back. It's only a haven for the idiots who uh, pontificate using old state models that have really uh, lost their way. You know, nothing says it more than even Jerome Powell is willing to, to throw the Phillips curve onto the trash heap of uh, long held bad ideas. Um, but the, the metals do of course play an important role and nothing says it more. I, I've been at uh, a quiet battle with the bastion of Keynesian thought, and I'm not deriding Keynesian thought because I think Keynes had a lot of good ideas, but I'm much more of a libertarian and believe that Joseph Schumpeter was a far greater economist who's underappreciated except by the Austrians, uh, who understood credit first and foremost, which is how you have to perceive to me in any quality analysis of the global macro system. But, why doesn't the IMF sell off its gold hoard? It's always boggled my mind. Or at least if they don't sell it off, monetize it by issuing gold-backed bonds. 
which I believe we're going to see from the Chinese and the Russians, mm -hmm. return, which would be a nice throwback at the Brits, because while the rest of the world is smoking opium, and instead of being gold bugs, uh, Godfrey, I, I, people will use that as a pejorative term, you're a gold bug. No, I'm not. I'm just a protecting the store of value. But I said, if you're calling me a gold bug in a pejorative sense, you must be a fiat currency bug. So which one would you perceive over the last hundred years has done better? So let's put that to rest. But I, I think that gold will play an important role. And I think that the Chinese will especially reveal this. And the Russians too, in order to give more credibility to their currency, will initially have some type of either commodity back, but certainly I think a precious metal back just to elevate themselves uh, in a way that they'll need to be, you know, greatly more accepted uh, before, uh, before they will really gain that, that stature. But I would throw this to uh, Claudio, which is if, if the Swiss citizens, and I know they voted on gold, they've had a couple of referendums and I love the Swiss referendums uh, by the way, I think uh, I actually had written a, a graduate school paper on the Swiss referendums when I was studying under a Finnish, um, what was his name, Perti Pessinen from Finland. So I go back quite a way. Uh, so I find those interesting, but I want to know why the Swiss are not busy liquidating some of their uh, equity assets and reasserting themselves into the precious metals world to me, that would make perfect sense because they have such enormous profits that it would be, and, and I agree, I love that Claudio called them a hedge fund because they are a hedge fund, but they have one thing that no other hedge fund has, which is a printing press. So no. it's easy to overcome your errors. <laughs> Even I'm a successful trader with that uh, mechanism. But my question, if I was if I was Thomas Jordan, uh, I don't have a lot of respect, sorry for Thomas Jordan, uh, uh, I would be, I would be start to liquidate quietly some of my uh, paper paper assets and start moving more more of my money into the hard assets, and that would be a, an important statement for the world. Just as what they've done uh, has been an important statement because they have been, as I say every year, I give the S and B the alchemist of the of the uh, last two millennium. They, what they have done is just the fact that they can keep printing Swiss and get the to accept them while they're buying assets. That, that is, that, that's a greater trick than Mario Draghi. And what, let me finish up with that. Mario Draghi's entrance into Italian po politics is really interesting to me. And we've seen the Italian yields drop under 50 basis points on a 10 year BTB, which is unbelievable. But while the media said, well, this is because Mario Draghi has so much ability and confidence, but yes, I'll tell Mario Draghi has always played a confidence game. And if Italy is actually, I think, pretty smart here because with Mario Draghi as prime minister, Europe can never say no to the Italians because Mario knows where every skeleton and every body is buried. And he's a dangerous force in running a country. And he, to me, the markets have understood it and they're bidding up Italian that because, hey, they know that Europe will guarantee they have to. There's, there's no alternative other than to blow Europe apart. And uh, I think Claudio and um, Godfrey have both laid that out. That's not happening. God, Godfrey, you might be surprised at, um, to learn that I am a very good friend of Bernard Connolly. And so I've had over the last 25 years such mega discussions uh, I came to him because people introduced because of my views on Europe going back to the late eighties and early nineties. And I was certainly uh, in the brief of Milton Friedman and um, Martin uh, Feldstein. And of course, one of the great of the last 30, 40 years, Rudy Dorn, all warned about the Europe was doing this backwards. They were creating a political union with the help of a Euro without ever getting to a unified, harmonized taxing system or uh, a, a euro bond. So, I mean, that's where I'll leave it. And what happens with this when it, when push comes to shove, 
But I think that Draghi's entry into this from a political level now is more than of a passing interest. Uh, your thoughts, Godfrey? On... Uh, that's an excellent uh, s- sum- uh, summary of, uh, of, of uh, the last few decades. Absolutely brilliant. And uh, yes, I mean, obviously, I knew that, but an awful lot of people listening to this won't know that. Um, uh, yes, absolutely fascinating. It is totally political. And I think my first lecture to Cambridge University was in about 1994, when I tried to explain to an economics faculty at Jesus College uh, at Cambridge exactly what this was all about. Uh, and it was terribly unfashionable. And uh, uh, although they were very hospitable, uh, they rather sneered at my assessment of the situation, of course, and that was somewhere in the region, that was six or seven, that was about eight years before actually the euro was launched. Uh, so all these things, and I've made speeches in the chamber on many occasions, it was, it's exactly right. It's a, it is a political system. And what they tried to do is bind people together with hoops of steel with a common currency, which is doomed to failure. Now, perhaps one thing that Ara might uh, uh, might like to perhaps respond to, and that is, yes, he's absolutely right uh, in his assessment of Mario Draghi, who is actually incidentally quite a charming fellow, <laughs> as most confidence tricksters are. Uh, but you can also, you can always support Portugal, you can support Greece, uh, you can rally round, uh, and you can kick the can down the road. But the Italian economy is really very much bigger than that. Uh, and although I accept the fact that Uh, they will have to somehow paper over the cracks with Italy. Sooner or later, uh, the whole ghastly truth of the matter must come out. You cannot cover for for Italy forever because there will come a time when the German taxpayer, uh, the German uh, middle class, begin to understand just what they've lost. At the moment, they think they've done jolly well by selling lots of BMWs and VWs and Audis and chemicals and so on and so forth to the rest of Europe. But of course, as we all know, they haven't been paid. And if you look at the shadow, if you look at Target 2 and the shadow banking, they're owned nearly a trillion euros. So they've exported all these wonderful cars and these wonderful goods, absolutely marvellous, but they haven't actually been paid in real terms. And they're going to find that out. And I think they're going to find that out sooner rather than later. And it's going to come as a huge shock to the German middle class. I guess on a final question in that front, uh, Wait, Godfrey. I, oh, okay, go I, ahead. I think, go ahead, Aaron. I, I think, uh, yeah, and that's, that's absolutely right. Those Target 2 accounts which is everybody just transferring money to Germany because you have to trust Germany. You know, there, I can, I'm more comfortable buying a bund at negative. Oh, I'm sorry, I just broke out in hives. The fact that I could say I could, I'm more comfortable buying a bund at negative 42 basis points than I am certainly buying a French oat at uh, negative uh, 22 basis points. I mean, this is, this is absolutely insanity. And... It was the French. It's always the French. I'm sorry. Uh, since 1871, it's always the French um, who muck up all things because the issue with the Italy was brought into the euro as usual at too high a level because the French demanded it. Because after the breakup uh, of, of September of 1992, when the pound drops out and, and the and the peseta and and the lira are pushed out and then they have to re reassess and revalued. Well, Milan was kicking Paris's butt in moving the fashion industry because Italy devalued the currency. While of course, uh, one of the great idiots of the last 25 years, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet was busy with the, the Fort Franc uh, fighting to sustain the level, I believe of the Franc to the Deutsche market 3.41. Uh, so, it, it, the Italians went on their merry way, but in order to bring it all together, they had to they had to threaten uh, the elites of Italy, and they had to come in at that level, which protected French industry. You know, th- these things don't go away, and I, I know that's what Godfrey's main point. They just don't. And the and as I've maintained, and I've written for twelve years, eleven years in my blog, well, especially after Draghi's um, July. Uh, of 2012 
uh, whatever it takes or our no taboos, that it is the German credit card that guarantees the whole project. Now, as long as that is sustained, the world can buy European debt. But it, as, as Godfrey rightly says, when the German populace say, you know what, our credit card is no longer securing this, then you better be long, buns and short, everything else in the entire thing. But it, when, when will that happen? I have no idea because the world is a building to fool itself. But it would, it, well, I, it, if, you know, if it all works out, just like the stock market is priced for Nirvana, bond yields in Europe, especially, I mean, worldwide, because it forces all debts. Global debt is so low because of, of course, the central banks, they deny it, but there's no other alternative to it. It's not because of excess global savings. It's nonsense. Um, because in order for capitalism to work, debt has to be priced at a level that uh, borrowers and uh, as Schumpeter would argue, entrepreneurs have to buy, you know, pay a certain price. Otherwise, when money's free, it just doesn't work. But as Schumpeter always learned that it's easier to stop a, a person from borrowing by raising rates than it is to get a person to borrow by lowering rates even to zero if there's no opportunity to generate a qualitative return on those borrowings. It's the world in which we live in. And uh, just a final question, uh, Godfrey, what are your thoughts on Brexit? And do you think <coughs> there's a possibility for Italy to pull out of the EU or the EMU? Well, that's a very interesting question. The, uh, the Generally speaking, uh, the European Union has been moderately supported by most of the people in most of the European Union countries, except the British, who've never really liked it, never really trusted it, because they were told it was simply a trade arrangement. The common market, it was sold to the British in 1974 referendum. It was said, oh, it's a common market. And people voted for it because a common market sounds very sensible. You know, no red tape which, of course, those of us who know about the European Union now laugh at, no red tape. The whole concept of the European Union is built on red tape. Anyway, we've gone, uh, and some of, the, uh, it's, some of the countries, it's very unpopular, especially the countries who have come out of the Soviet Union. They're beginning to realise it's not what, quite what they thought either. So you've got your Hungarians and your Poles, uh, your Baltic states and your Central Europeans like the Czech Republic, were beginning to think this isn't quite what they wanted and not quite what they signed up to. They didn't sign up to a central super state to be told what to do by Brussels. And they don't want that any more than they do, did want to be told what to do by Moscow. Uh, and it's a very slow learning curve for them, but it's, they're starting to push back. And I think the time will come um, when some, uh, something will trigger. Something will trigger. And I don't know what that trigger is going to be. Uh, it could be Italy. I think it's still, I did suggest this in Cambridge in the mid-1990s, that it would be Italy in some way. Uh, they're a very, um, I love Italy, and they're very uh, uh, an interesting people, a lively people, a volatile people. Uh, and I think uh, the British will put up with almost anything because we're all we're a bit sheep like we British, and we just go along with the flow. But the Italians aren't like that. And I think it will break. And interestingly enough, the French Euroscepticism is coming to the fore under Marine Le Pen. Uh, and it could be uh, France that actually decides that they've had enough of this, because it was all written very well when the European Union was a German horse with a French jockey. That isn't quite the case now. And I think whether the French uh, cut the French public electorate, who are quite a sophisticated electorate, more sophisticated than the British electorate, will suddenly begin to realise this isn't quite what they wanted either. I think the whole thing will implode. It could be led by a collapse of the ECB, um, but it could be any number of things. But as Ira says, when? The question is, when will all this happen? And of course, that's the key. That's the key. If we knew when, wouldn't we all be very rich men? And your thoughts, Claudio? Yeah, you know, you know, Germany has been the economic powerhouse of the European Union. 
And as we can see, you know, they are deindustrializing uh, tremendously or very fastly. And um, so, yeah, I think, you know, we are really, we are moving towards a huge change. And, and nobody knows how long, you know, it, it, it's going to last. I mean, I don't even know how the world would look like in six months time, to be honest. And, um, but I just, you know, I just want to say, yeah, people, you know, prepare for the worst. The world has changed. And um, and make sure that you have your own, that you have your financial independency, some stuff which is independent of the financial system, so that you have your insurance on the side, which is hard hard assets, physical precious metals, and so on. And um, and let's wait and see uh, what what's coming out uh, over the coming months. Great. And final thoughts, Ira. Yeah, I, all of the above. So. Um, yep. It's not quite as clear. One of the great uh, works of uh, uh, Neil Ferguson, when he writes his history of World War One, and how they kept going along, going along, going along, you know, and everybody figured, oh, you know, uh, because the bond markets were in total uh, negation, even as the trains were 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 running to the fronts with troops there. The bond markets uh, really never reflected it, and which is surprising because I always look to the bond markets. But right now they're in the throes of. Th that's the world that is just been thrown so up in the air. Um, again, we saw it yesterday with Powell's uh, testimony. But I, I'll leave you with this: in 2016, I was at a, um, a seminar in Chicago, at the, where I'm originally from, and station, and I was at the it's Chicago Global Initiative. It was June 27th. Godfrey, you'll appreciate this, 2016. So it was the Monday after the Brexit vote. And Jerome Powell, who was not yet, uh, he was just a Fed governor, he was not chair yet, but he's talked about the world, da 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 So, and then it came to the Q&A. And I had the last question just by happenstance. And I asked him after all this, I asked him who guarantees the ECB? With all that purchasing of debt, who guarantees that? I wanted to hear a Fed governor. And without blanching, he said, they have a printing press. And just remember that because that, that's the mindset that exists within those walls and they will defend it. But their defense of that printing press and, and the, the privilege of printing is uh, what is weigh, weighs heavily upon the world. And it, that's what makes China really so to watch. And, uh, and as Godfrey, I can tell by his uh, historical analysis, the Chinese, unlike a lot of other people, they don't forget. And they are, and I'm in the middle of reading uh, Deng's um, uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, biography right now, the wonderful one by Ezra Vogel, once you get through the first 100 pages. But it's it's really pretty good. And you realize the Chinese don't forget. And the scars from uh, the opium wars, and which was a, 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 an attempt to debase the Chinese money, which was silver-backed by then, um, those remain. So I keep my eyes on China as to how they're going to attack the global monetary system. And I think that's gonna be a big story in the next five or 10 years. Uh, as, and it'll play out slowly, but it's worth watching, but that's where it puts us. So I guess that's where we can end it. Great, and just thought um, if we could make a round on uh, explaining to our listeners how they can learn more about your work or keep in touch, uh, Godfrey. Uh, everything's on my website, which is terribly easy. <clears throat> it's just Godfrey Bloom, small case, dot UK. And you'll find uh, articles and videos and bits and pieces. And uh, I hope we enjoy it. And certainly thank you for inviting me onto your show. Yes, thank you so much. And Claudio? Well, I also have my own uh, homepage. It's claudiograss.ch. So I'm also publishing uh, roughly four articles a month about uh, precious metals, geopolitics, philosophy. I think, you know, it's, it's a combination of, of different topics. And, um, and everyone can sign up for free. 
So that's where they will find me. Great, and Ira? Well, I'm still uh, writing uh, from underground, not as frequently, but the story seems to be so much uh, embedded, uh, suffering uh, some things, and you wonder why uh, it allows me to voice. And, and the readership is a, because of the, uh, as you know, Richard, the exchange that takes place, the dialogue after an article is published, and we go back and forth. Uh, pretty good. So notes from underground. Uh, you can go to uh, Ira Harris, Y R A H A R R I S dot com, and notes from underground will pop up, and you can uh, register for it. And like uh, Claudio and Godfrey, it's free. Uh, I invite the dialogue as long as it's. We stay away, as I say, it's not a political. This is about policies and how to do uh, create uh, smarter trades and smarter investments. Uh, and that's, that's what it is. And it has a nice global following, which is important of uh, a really good dialogue. So I await uh, Claudio to go to Claudio and Godfrey's uh, websites, but notes from underground and you can get the Ira Harris, Y-R-A-H-A-R-R-I-S dot com. So that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for the insightful discussion. Thank you. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.